as we think about cycles in the market and we think about opportunities to realize value, certainly carve out transactions should, I think, be a big and active part of the conversation. But they bring complexity and challenges. But we've got Greg, so <laughs> I know we're going to see through it. So Greg Albert, who leads this discipline and expertise, is going to chair the next discussion. Uh, so take it away, Greg. Thanks for Great. being here. Thank you very much, William. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. My name is Greg Albert. As the screen says, I need not repeat, but I will anyway. I'm a managing director in Accenture Strategy. I've been doing acquisitions and divestitures my entire career, starting off in venture capital at Kleiner Perkins in the West Coast. Met a girl, which happens, moved me to the East Coast, Philadelphia, where I joined DuPont's Corp Dev team. And then after a tour of duty at McKinsey, found my way to Accenture, where I'm one of our global leaders in our acquisitions and divestitures practice. Um, it's, very, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, and joined by my esteemed guests, I'm just going to give a little bit of a preamble and we'll, we'll dive right into the substance. So I think as I'm listening at the table here in the middle of the room with all of you during the entire day, a whole bunch of meta trends have been kind of sprinkled out that leads to acquisitions. And while I think there's a lot of overlap between some of those catalysts on acquisitions to divestitures, I think there are some very unique challenges that we are hearing from our clients from Fortune 500 all the way up to Fortune 10 companies at the board level and then down to the operations level that I think are relevant to start teasing out before we get into a really open dialogue. And what we are all hoping for is not a lecture in a university setting. This is meant to be a contact sport. So rather than wait to the end in terms of Q&A, feel free to raise your hand, throw things at them, and then we'll be happy to answer questions as they come along. Okay. So, you know, in terms of the meta trends that are impacting boards of directors' decisions on portfolios, so you, you know, you go through the normal strategic planning process. And over the last eight to ten years, we've seen a very clear evolution of how those processes unfold. Whereas before, it was the kind of prima facie case that every one of our businesses that we have in our portfolio, we're going to keep and invest or use as a cash cow to generate returns for shareholders. Because of the pace of change in technology, electrification of, of vehicles, um, you know, the switching from a hydrocarbon over time to electron-based economies, geopolitical tensions, which we've talked about, regulatory issues, et cetera, et cetera, you know, the, the dialogue has changed from we're going to keep as the going in assumption to build the case that you should stay. Be you president. Build the case that you should not be sold off to someone else or that we are not an advantaged owner of your, this business anymore as a result of a number of the different catalysts that we've heard people talking about today, such as activist investors. And one comment before I, before I start fielding questions is, it's interesting when we've been thinking about activist investors in all of their forms you know, we've been thinking about Fortune 500 companies, but never would it be thought of that a Fortune 10 company would be approached by an activist investor. Then AT&T, approached by an activist investor. That has really shook in a number of boards of directors that at least we've been speaking to that is anyone off limits from an activist investor, whether they are looking to catalyze improvement in margins or getting into new markets or challenges with doing business. I do a lot of work in semiconductor and how does that relate to challenges we have with, with China today based on whatever tweet comes out in any moment in time. Um, so I'm going to give a little thought experiment and pose this to our esteemed panel here. And this is a, uh, not even an experiment, this is a true, true story. So a board of directors meetings just concluded the CEO, CFO, Chief Strategy Officer exit the meeting. The CEO looks to the CFO and Chief Strategy Officer and said, hey, you heard what the board just decreed. We're going to divest BUA and sub-BUB. Good luck. Let me know how it turns out. Let me know if you have any questions. Now, the good news from Accenture perspective, that's usually when we get the call. But for right now, there's no phone, there's no email. And the, and the CEO and you guys all sit together, what's the first couple of things that, would need, that you would want to think through to do immediately after that meeting to start this process? Well, uh, you know, the first thing I'd do is I'd go see my tax director. 
um, because in any transaction, especially a carve-out transaction or a spin, if you do a spin, there's going to be friction costs. And most of the friction costs are going to fall under the tax group. And with efficient planning, you can, you know, first of all, you understand what those friction costs are, and you can start to plan for them. And it may be that you embrace those costs because your board wants you to move fast. And so you understand that, that you know, if you can affect, let's say, for example, a tax-free spin uh, in the States, that that won't be a tax-free restructuring in China to accomplish the ultimate goal of separating that business, and that that will cost $30 million if you do it this fiscal year or $10 million if you do it next fiscal year. But whatever it is, I start with the tax folks because the tax folks can inform you and help you develop your step plan. And then once you have a step plan, you can kind of ground your overall plan into reality and start socializing it with the business unit leaders, understanding what the next step should be. Um, and then, you know, well, I, I could go on and on. but. Mm -hmm. So the first step is to go to tax. Tax. OK. Well, so for full disclosure, that meeting that you described has happened to us. So Hewlett Packard, we were a Fortune 10 company at the time, had an activist on our board, and decision was made to actually go through the split of the company, then do a spin-off of our services division, then do a spin-off of our um, legacy software division. So that's about roughly $75 billion worth of spins, left and right, over 120 countries. Crazy, I wouldn't advise you do that for your own health. Um, what happens, I think, is there, there's one fundamental thing, which is define your North Star. What are you trying to achieve, and what is the North Star? And you will find out that in those meetings, there's a lot of North Stars, but actually, the truth is there's just one, and there should be just one. And so the first question, I think, is, CEO, CFO, whoever, what, is, what are we trying to achieve? Are we going to prefer speed over cost? And, and you made the point, it's going to be costly if you want to be fast. Are we going to prefer a full restructuring? Do we want to, what, what is it exactly that we are achieving? And I can tell you that it was very clear, our CEO Meg Whitman was 100% clear about what uh, the North Star was, it was speed. It was make it happen, and make it happen in the timeline um, that I've given you. That, that's kind of the first thing. Then there's tactical things, which is scoping. I, I would start scoping, because it's easy to say, OK, let's get rid of the printing division. Printing division can mean a lot of things, and you have to scope. You have to understand what is in scope and what isn't in scope, who goes, who stays. Um, and that will inform who you can sell to. Um, the type of transaction you'll do, that's when I bring in the tax guys, not before. Uh, don't tell them. Um, and, and, um, and it will tell you, and, and what are the expectations? And the second thing is set expectations. Once you've started doing that, I think your first discussion with the CEO is, these things are costly and complex. And so let's, let's talk about timing. Let's talk about making sure everyone's on the same page. Perfect. So, um Similar to Sergio, I also had a similar experience in my previous company where I joined and the second day the CFO comes to me and says, oh, we have, as a board decided, we want to divest one of our divisions. And, um, and so he's like, that's it and we need to go. And the first thing that we did was forming up a core team uh, from the legal, having one of the senior exec VPs who was heading, he was not heading the division directly, but as part of it. And, uh, and, and thinking about the three things that you were trying to allude to is that, what are we trying to get to here? And three things that we focus on is scope, value, and timing. What is important to us? And in that particular case, value was important to us. The business we still liked and we wanted to own it unless we got the right value for it. And so we then focused on understanding how we can derive the best value for that business and then driving the scope and, scope and timing to kind of match towards that. But, forming the right team and understanding what we are after was again important for us and de deciding which of those three elements was key to us uh, was, was very important. Hmm. Okay, no, that's all, that's all good. So let's, let's keep going on that and we'll go down, we'll yeah. go the other way. <laughs> if you're interested in additional information on innovation and M&A, I encourage you to check out the Transaction Advisors Institute, which is a robust source for knowledge on M&A best practice. We host a series of M&A conferences, run an elite M&A academy, offer M&A master classes, conduct M&A research, organize the M&A Leadership Council, and publish a prestigious M&A journal. Members of the Transaction Advisors Institute include corporate executives, board members, 
and private equity investors that are interested in understanding the critical issues impacting transaction planning, structuring, and execution. I encourage you to get more involved in the Institute. Right? So we have these three variables that you know, you're going to be solving for as you think through the entire, I'll call it divestiture process effort, which includes the transaction, the separation, and ultimately the transition, should it be a divestiture versus a spin, right? So speaking of divestiture versus spin, what are some of the big considerations that'll lead to the conclusion of we're going to divest, carve, sell, TSAs, and all the fun that comes along with that? Or we're actually going to spin it out into a fully owned subsidiary, publicly traded company, some kind of a joint venture, et cetera. So what are the, some of the considerations that go into that? Yeah, so as you look at spin versus divest, uh, what we tend to think about or what I have done in the past is, is there a right buyer for this business, uh, whether it's strategic or, or even a financial sponsor in some cases, but is there a right buyer for this business? Does it fit within somebody's portfolio? Uh, is there enough, enough of a buyer universe that can, that can look at this uh, from a transaction standpoint? Um, and as you compare that to a spin-off, the question then becomes is that, is there a public market for this kind of a transaction, for, for this kind of an asset? Is it big enough to trade publicly in the public markets? Um, and, and, and who are going to be the investors in this case as well? And so the other piece uh, is that, how easy is it to carve out? Is it, is it, if it's on a standalone, it's easy to carve out, probably a spin probably works better. Versus if it's a carve out with has all these TSAs and things of that nature, it's part of a larger site for us. I mean, we are in the chemical manufacturing business and we are one of the largest chemical companies. So for us, a lot of our sites have multiple businesses within that same site. And is it easy to carve out that business and make it as an own publicly traded or a spin-off entity versus a divestiture whereby we still have those TSAs or long-term agreements? what have you, and so that sometimes drives that as well. And then over about all of this is value. Where are you going to get the best value? Uh, the public markets, uh, depending on where they are and how the markets are trading, will decide if you want to put that business in the public markets today, this is where it's going to get traded at. Whereas if you have the right buyer universe, you probably get a premium on the business uh, and drive the most value through that, uh, through that process. Makes sense. Yeah. I, I agree with everything you said. I, I just add two considerations. One is, the viability of a business as a standalone business, is it a business that can stand on its own feet and be viable? That's actually one of the, the items the board is meant to judge and, and is judged on in terms of fiduciary duties. Um, and, and so if it is viable, then you can consider a spin. If it isn't, if it needs a home, if, if it needs a place where it will um, grow, then you need to look for a buyer. Now you can do a spin merge. You can spin and merge. Mm -hmm. Then the question becomes, where do you want the value to go? Where do you want the value? Do you want the value to accrue immediately to shareholders and you as a company don't get much of the value or do you want the value to go through you? Spin, value goes to shareholders straight away divestiture value comes to you in the first place, ultimately, hopefully, to shareholders as well. Um, and obviously, there's tax considerations, which is the, the, the bigger the transaction, the bigger is the tax cost. And if you do a tax-free spin, you're actually maximizing big time the, the value that goes back to shareholders. So yeah, I, I agree with, with both your, your comments. I think that the, the critical thing is if you're going to consider a spin versus a divestiture. Is, is understanding whether it could be a tax-free spin. Because if it can't, you've got you know, two yeah. levels of taxation. The company pays a tax on distribution, and the shareholders pay a tax on what they receive. And that just might not, that might make the deal upside down. Um, the, um, the other thing I think you need to do is, is really take a hard look at, at the company's ability to engage in something as large as a spin if it involves a carve-out. Because it is a massive undertaking. And, and once you set that, that in motion, you really have to be disciplined and stick to a timeline and make sure you keep people um, focused on the goal, but also not forget that they are people and, and they have day jobs too. And, and you're trying to undergo this massive um, you know, transformative transaction, which is to, you, to separate a, a, a company and spin it out as a public company. And not, not every company is capable of doing that. I mean, doing a whole clone and carve exercise, for example, separating your IT systems is a massive undertaking. I mean, we had Accenture you know, all up in our shop for six months doing that alone. And um, I mean, 
you know, not to mention you know, setting up a, a standalone credit facility and, and you know, talk about viability. I mean, can, can both companies stand under the weight of the indebtedness that they will have post-spin? Mm -hmm. You know, the market might not think so. I think you're, you're touching on, on something very important, which is the, the feasibility of the transaction, which is it may sound like a good idea on paper. The bankers and the advisors will be like, yeah, in three months it will be done, no problem. And when you start unpeeling that onion, mm -hmm you look at who is the universe of potential buyers. Can they catch the ball that you're going to throw their way? That, that makes a huge difference. And not everyone can catch the ball. Do you have to stand up operations so that you give them a, a pre-packaged deal? And standing up operations, IT systems, for example, is, is an extremely cumbersome endeavor. And I think you can't underestimate how distracting it is to, um, to the parent. And, and even if it's the greatest idea, if you don't have the right structure, um, those things can be real black holes of your management time, of your money, and effectively of the stamina of the company. And, and while you're doing this, you still have to sell your products, still have to continue succeeding as a company. That, that is one big consideration before you engage into any of these. And, and if I may uh, tell a story, probably my CEO and general counsel wouldn't like me to do this, but so I'm at Tenneco. Tenneco back last year, uh, I basically joined in March of last year and went straight into a negotiation session with Carl Icahn to buy Federal Mogul for five and a half billion. And, and the, Carl had tried to spin, uh, do a spin with Federal Mogul and had failed because the market just didn't want it. He tried to sell half of Federal Mogul. The market didn't want parts of it, what he wanted to sell. So he found us as a buyer because we came up with the bright idea that we would take his business, reconstitute it, so while we're doing an integration, restructure everything, create one company that does something completely different from what Tenneco does now. I mean, it's the same business units, you know, four verticals reconfigured uh, under two different business units, and then spin out a whole other company. And, and we were ambitious and aggressive about the timing. But you've also got to understand you have to really set realistic sites, and there are things that are going to come up that will be bumps in the road. For example, we found that um, when we were doing our carve-out financials, that we just could reconcile some of the, the data from the federal mogul side of the house, and so we had to announce a delay of our spin, and our stock price tanked. So this is like a you know it's a big big deal to get this stuff right, and to be very measured when you approach this. So we we talked about this is definitely sounds like a multidisciplinary activity, right? This is not stuck in law or stuck in the legal function. It's not stuck in tax. It's not stuck in corp dev. This is like a whole jazz ensemble that needs to come together to ultimately separate the business with a lot of different instruments, if you will, playing at different parts of the time to get to legal close or day one. Buyer agnostic, just for a second. So as we think about that kind of jazz ensemble, you know, from a legal perspective, your job is to close the deal, right? From a corp dev perspective, it's also close the deal, finalize negotiations, get the money in the bank if it's a divestiture. But, I mean, are you involved in the ultimate business decisions around the separation and framing up, I think you mentioned this, like the, the deal perimeter, what's in, what's out, not take a, a chainsaw, but much more of a scalpel, down to the Mary and Fred and James, are they in, are they out, or are they other, right? Other, which is a whole different conversation in terms of stranded costs. But, so as you think about that kind of sausage making, you know, do you have any um, um, stories or best practices to share? Yeah, no, I think after having done a few of these car routes, I think the main, main important thing is the preparation up front and having the definition of the deal perimeter and the scope definition. Because having a broad, broad definition is fine, but the car route, once you launch the process, once you start calling potential buyers, the timing is not on your side. You mm -hmm. are running against time. And the longer it takes, the longer you lose value. So the more prepared you are up front, um, whether it's tax, whether it's legal, whether it's HR, whether it's IT, whether it's operations, whether it's insurance, um, things of that nature um, are very important. For in our industry, environmental is pretty key as well. So there are car routes that I've been involved in where we would get the phase ones done up front. So when the buyers come asking, we already have information to give them instead of them asking and then us being uh, reactive to that. So the more you can be proactive and be ready with that information, the more it helps you speed up that process as you go down uh, once you launch. So 
I would make a difference in the sausage making between a small divestiture and a massive spin or a massive curve out. Small divestiture, you, you kind of have a master in the house that makes the decisions, that's the parent, and, and you eventually get to find who makes the decision, and it's your traditional chain of command that will be making the decisions. And there will, will be plenty, but it's a small divestiture, you have someone. Um, in a big spin, Effectively, at some point, the businesses become very partisan. They become very biased to their own business. And at that stage, and let's start sharing nuggets, stuff that we've done in practice that may help your practice. Um, what we did is actually create a team that would represent one side of the business, another the other side, and a corporate team with someone who's, who, who effectively was paved to go retire after the, after a deal. So no, no stakes, no um, I will be the CFO of this business or this one. Um, and whose job was to form a team of corporate advisors that would take the interest of the shareholders and that would try to make the best decisions um, for both units combined as opposed to have a fight and see who wins that fight. Um, it proved to be extremely efficient. There was always someone suspicious that that guy was biased towards one or the other, um, but that make a huge difference because when you are in those processes, there are decisions to make every five seconds. There is a who gets that building, who gets this, and this business unit that no one knew about, um, and what do we do about Kazakhstan, and, and so on. And if you don't have that neutral party, then it's like, no, you take Kazakhstan. Oh, no, no, it's fine, it was yours. Um, and I love Kazakhstan, by the way. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it makes a real difference to have that set up. And you know what? It's something you need to think about, as you said, before the deal starts. It's not something you can improvise while you are running around and people are fighting each other. It has to be put in place and the rules of the road have to be very, very clear. Uh, so I agree 100%. That's actually what we did. Um, the, the refinement side add to that is that I think you have to, even still, with, with that setup, First of all, your board's going to be a tiebreaker on things that, that, that your central your managing uh, corporate board can't resolve. But the other thing, though, is that you really do, in my mind, like when to set up that second management team is a, is a really tricky timing question. Because if you do it too soon, then they're too involved in the process. You're dealing with too much of, this, um, of these issues coming up that have to be resolved. But you don't want to set them up too late because they need some runway to get used to running the company, especially if it's going to be a public company and it's going to spin. I mean, they need to be stood up. Um, so it's a delicate balancing act. Is, so in our case, because we ended up delaying our spin, you know, we stood up the other management team a little too soon. <laughs> but, um, but you have to keep your eye on that. And then it creates those tensions, which – and people start to – it's not just at the, at the senior levels, too. I mean, you start to feel – because there are red people and blue people in, in these deals. People that know they're going to go to one business unit or the other because that's just where they live. But then there are purple people, you know, people who are in enterprise and are, are, don't really belong in one place or the other, and they know they're going to get assigned. And you just start to see allegiances shifting, and, and people's interests start to shift. And, and that's you know, keeping it, your pulse on the people aspect, I think, is a critical thing to do if you want to weather one of these things because it's like sprinting a marathon at points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that applies to the larger carve-outs, because in a small carve-out, things are reasonably clear. One thing we did is for functional people, for the people that were actually delivering the deal, we got to know which side of the house we would go reasonably late. So we, we, I wasn't told, I was told you can go in both, uh, in, in either, um, but the decision was made reasonably late. And I think, although I hated it at the time, um, it kept us honest to not side too early with one side or the other. And, and that is a fundamental feature that you should be enabling. So we're, we're talking again about the, the red, how many, we have red, blue, and purple people, right? I love that, by the way. Is that trademark, counselor? Can I? Yeah, yeah. I, I got on a trademark. You have a trademark on that? We're being recorded. Okay, very good. All right. Uh, we'll talk license fees later, right? But talking about these different people, you know, I had a case where, um, again, a very large semiconductor client asked for assistance to help carve out one of their lower margin businesses for very good strategic rationale. Great. Started the process, the separation. We had a buyer. We had an announcement. Great. Then the CFO calls me in and says, all right, we got this giant project called divestiture, right? We're going through all this pain. It's, nobody is having fun. We're basically saying goodbye to all of our friends in Separate Co., right? What else can we do now? 
that we were unable or unwilling to stomach before and just throw it onto this bag of mess, right? <laughs> so in other words, a divestiture is a terrible thing to waste. Is there anything else that we could throw on to this because, you know, we'll never have another one. We don't, we don't want to miss the opportunity to miss the opportunity to do something we were too lazy to do before, whether it's restructure our corporate legal entities or rip out our old ERP, put in something very new, or, you know, redo our procurement process or look at order to cash, procure to pay, record to record, dot, dot, dot. So <coughs> that was kind of the discussion, right? And we had an intellectual debate, but I know we also did amongst us. So... With that, with that kind of primer, you know, what, what say you? So, so two things to that. So one way to think about that is that if whatever the business is going, if you are a levered company, is there some debt that can go with that business? And that is some one way to kind of handle that as well, where is that new business, the divestiture business, instead of doing a cash-free, debt-free, does that, does that carry some debt along with it that can be supported? Uh, that, that's part of it. Whatever is staying back, and this is what we did again in the previous company that I was with, where... When we sold off that business, we looked at, before even we got to the signing, we started thinking about what are our stranded costs and how do we kind of eliminate some of our stranded <coughs> costs. Because that was one third of our overall business, one third of our portfolio. And so there were going to be a lot of stranded costs that we were going to keep on. And we started thinking about it even before we got to signing of how do we handle that? What do we focus on? How do we restructure some of our operations to now align with the business, which is going to be one third less or one third smaller than where it was before? And so that took a lot of effort even before signing. So we had a separate team just looking at the stranded cost uh, itself versus doing the transaction. So we had two of those uh, things going in parallel. Got it. So I know we had a, a debate on the topic. And so in our first separation, very, very first separation, which is $255 billion companies going left and right, um, we decided to simplify the corporate structure. We decided to rationalize some of our IT systems. We decided to do a lot more than just separate the companies. Um, and it's not an easy process to spin out and to split two companies to do a spin-off. I can tell you that the biggest issues that we faced and those that actually could have put the, the deal in danger came from those ancillary projects. They didn't come from the core spin. The core spin wasn't easy, but the, the real thing that could have <coughs> killed the deal came from one of these projects which was going sideways and, and could delay everything. And so second spin we do, we say no more of that. We're going to give the, it's a spin merge, so there was an acquirer technically, but we're going to give you the unit as it is, and if you want to restructure, dear buyer, you restructure as much as you want, but we are not going to, um, to, to help you in any of that because we need to stick to the timeline. Third deal, the buyer, another uh, spin merge, the buyer says, okay, but you um, set up a brand new IT systems infrastructure, a, a platform that is brand new because we, we hate your um, old dusty uh, system that's made of a lot of spun merge companies. We had to agree, it was part of the deal. That's the one single item that, um, again, was a disaster, was a nightmare. It happened, but it was a nightmare. It was extremely costly, um, and it, it's the one thing that could have delayed the deal. So. Words of wisdom, if you can push back, if you can say, look, we will do the things that are fundamental to the deal, that make sense in the context of the deal, and not take advantage of it just to, uh, okay, people are now on board, so let's, let's try to uh, repaint every office in blue. Um, I hope I don't have to pay a fee for the blue. Um, <laughs> I, I would suggest you, you try to draw those lines. And it's very hard because, yes, the CFOs and the, uh, everyone is very excited about the, hey, this is our occasion to reduce the number of entities we have. Um, now, if a liquidation um, is in process and is a gating item, liquidations can take years in certain countries. And I'm not sure that when you go back to your CFO, say, well, by the way, you know what? We'll have to wait another six months for the spin. That goes any, any well. That, it doesn't work. <laughs> I, I agree. I mean, if whether it's a spin, you know, public or a merge or a a carve out divestiture, I think that you know, the 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 step plan is your bible. Follow that. Don't don't try and get cute and fancy. I'm I'm kind of compulsive. Uh, my wife would attest to that. And and so when I looked at the org chart for our company, I thought, well, why do we have? I asked, like, well, why do I have three opcos in the U.S.? Why do I have two opcos in Germany? And maybe we can merge these things. And then you start to realize as you think this stuff through that. 
you know, every work stream has dependencies on this stuff. I mean, you got you know payroll and you got pensions and works councils and and then you've got in, liabilities like environmental and, and you start you know collapsing this stuff, you create you know many more problems than than you could even anticipate. So it's just better to keep it simple, yeah, and, and stick to the original plan. So in terms of the dependencies and keeping it simple and getting into the what I'll call the guts of project planning, you know, does anybody have any? Other examples or questions in terms of the, the, again, the transaction, the transition, the separation? Through silence. You've been talking about carve outs from really the seller's perspective. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about, uh, from the buyer's perspective, what can the buyer expect from the seller in terms of really defining that perimeter and ensuring that there is something that's truly separable versus, again, the seller? maybe having the opportunity to bundle things to get rid of things they don't want. How do you, how do you account for that? So I'll, let me take the first step and then just one quick, I mean, so the, the question was, if everybody heard is, what can the seller to do, if I can paraphrase, proactively to make sure that what they're ultimately bidding to buy is what they actually get and that they're not getting any of the stranded stuff that they don't want and they're only getting, quote, unquote, the white meat. My words, not, not yours, right? Okay, so number one, I, I think three things real quick, and then I'll, I'll jump to my, the panel. Number one is to be extraordinarily concrete early in the, in the deal process around the teaser document, the SIM, and entry into the VDR, right? So that's, while it sounds very simple and academic, but that's where the negotiations begin, literally at step one. I think step two is getting a handle on what you actually get on day one in terms of a business that's continuing to operate substantially similar to that in the previous 12 months. How many TSAs are you, going, are you, are you signing up for? Because remember, who's ever providing you the TSAs, the Selco? This is not what, nobody wants to do TSAs. Nobody says, I can't wait to do transitional service agreements, right? Like that's nobody's objective. And then I think number three is pressuring the seller to prove that they're going to get on day one what they've actually bought, what they're, what they're paying for on day one. So what we go through is what's called a business simulation to demonstrate in a very fungible, palpable way that their order to cash process is actually going to work. And we go painstaking step by painstaking step, starting with the order of, hello, I am salesperson who are high customer, all the way through to the person monitoring the bank account saying that cash is in the bank all the way step by step. I think that it is a fair play, particularly on the larger deals where billions are at stake, that you, you request those through the closed window. So uh, from a buyer standpoint, I think one thing that we need to keep in mind is whether it's a stock deal or an asset deal. Because if it's a stock deal, I think you get a lot of it is already operating. There are environmental permits or what have you that comes with the stock entity, so you're, you're probably fine. When you go down to the asset deal side, I think that's when it gets more tricky because you need to make sure that every table and chair that you need comes with it. And so we worked on a transaction last year whereby we bought a company. It was a part of a carve out from a larger company and it was an asset deal. And one thing that we did, it was a bilateral negoti negotiated deal. But one thing we, we asked for the seller to provide was to provide the disclosure schedules much earlier than you normally are used to. So that way you get to see what all is in there and what else do you need. And are you getting comfortable around what you are getting? Because yes, we can put it in the, in the SPA or the APA that it should be operating in all material respects and all that. But we need to understand what we are taking on. And the earlier we can get to the disclosure schedules, we thought that was, uh, that was useful for us to get to signing in a timely manner. Yeah. It's, it's a very good question, and, and I, uh, I think it's a question every buyer should have in mind. And I think there's, there's one good news, which is these are long processes. So there is time. It's not as if you're given a business and you, you have to go with it. So there will be time for you as a buyer to do further due diligence. Even if you've signed between signing and closing to understand what, what is being packaged how, and I think there's a couple of things you can do. The first one is you should negotiate certain supervision rights as to how the carve-out is done so that you can, um, you, you're sold a house on plan. Um, well, you, you can inspect how the house is being built and you, you 
Well, it, it, it aches me because I was stellar, but you, you probably could get some consent rights. I wouldn't give them to you, but um, <laughs> consent rights for certain material deviations to the plan. Um, you can, you, you, but there's a notion of, of oversight. Now, the other thing you should do, you absolutely should do, is at the very beginning of the process, be crystal clear as to what you are intending to buy. So what am I in for as the buyer? Yes, you have this services division you want to sell. Um, well, I w would like to buy this. It needs to be in this shape and be crystal clear so that then, even if the contract doesn't exactly mirror what you said at the very beginning, you can anchor on, on principles. And last, which is we, we had to get there in, in one of our deals, if there are items on which the, the trust level is limited, and one of, of the, our, our services division was a $20 billion services division, lots of people, lots of cost, and the acquirer, um, as much as they trusted us, they, they, we spent about a year together doing this deal, um, put a cap on how much um, functional cost would go over. And, and they negotiated that we shouldn't send them on day one a penny more than X billion dollars, it's all public, of, um, of cost. That's a way of keeping everyone honest, of, of, of saying, look, this is important to me. If this doesn't happen that way, then, then there will be a monetary consequence or the deal may not happen. And I think those things have to be put up front very early in the process. Um, I think this panel will be more fun if we all disagreed more. <laughs> but uh, two, two refinements I'd add, and, and it kind of gets at your question sort of through the back door. but. Um, you know, it seems to me, at least in my career, I used to think about um, you know, starting ramping up the TSA process, sort of like almost between sign and close, maybe a bit before we'd sign, we'd have a framework of a, of a TSA and we'd really work on the TSA terms between sign and close. Um, also with PMI, post merger integration planning, you start to ramp that up between sign and close. Now I really think best practice is to start both of those things sooner, as soon as you can. And, and that's sort of a backdoor way to identify what you're getting and what you're not getting. Absolutely. Let me, let me jujitsu that question right back, oh. right? A little bit, right? Just to add some tension, right? So obviously, <laughs> oh, oh, obviously buying a carved out business, very different from buying the whole thing, right? It's, you know, it's like buying an apartment as part of a building, but you don't own the building, you're just getting the apartment versus buying the whole thing. It's very different. So if you think about PMI, merger integration, starting, you know, kind of beginning with the end in mind is getting those teams stood up. So has anybody bought, been through an acquisition of a carve out that on day one there was kind of a whoops? And don't worry, we're turning off the camera. No, we're not. Yes, we are. Anybody want to admit but doesn't want to raise their hand? Nope. So, okay, I'll admit. All right, how about that? All right, I'll... So by working with a client, um, large 22 countries, $2.7 billion deal, um, strategic acquire, experienced acquire, and on day one, somewhere through the planning process, um, payroll was dropped. So now you're bringing on, and you have all these different legal entities transferring over, and everybody's bank account belongs to a legal entity, and everybody's bank and all of this stuff and it was like uh, you had that, you had that, nobody had that, right? So that was a bit of a scramble. Ultimately we went old tech the client, and we used paper checks and handled those out, right, for the first pay cycle and ultimately got on rhythm but that was something that popped up and there's no better way to screw up an acquisition in terms of culture, community, <laughs> any, than not paying people on day one. Right? That's number one. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, pay your people. Right? Um, so I saw another question back there. Yeah. Hi, Greg. I'm Stuart, like announced with FTI. From a seller standpoint, as you're preparing something to be sold, uh, sometimes it may go to private equity buyer, sometimes may go to strategic, as you just mentioned, uh, and sometimes large corporations seem to not want to prepare the carve-out well to go one way or the other, and they'll say, well, we'll see who the buyer is, then we'll do that. So talk about, from a seller standpoint, uh, why that is and why there's not better preparation for one or the other, and then the mad scramble after that. 
That's a, it's a great question. So, and obviously, the, the, if, I can, if I'm reading your question right, sir, it's that a strategic would be able to, quote, unquote, catch something, whereas a private equity, equity buyer would have nothing, has no capability to catch. So generally, and I want to hear everybody's opinion, what we generally advise is assume the worst, which is, in this case, a financial, because assuming they have nothing that they can catch, so prepare the business as if you're going to provide all these different TSAs. Prepare the business as if you're going to clone and you know, lift, shift, and drop all of your infrastructure, applications, and data for a day one event. And then lastly is prepare for day one before legal close. Run as if they're a separate business at an arm's length in terms of TSAs. Because remember, prior to day one, you know, we, you and I are on the, on the same team, and then on day one, by definition, we now work for different companies, right? So we need to kind of go through that change management process. So generally, that's our recommendation out of the gate. So just I, scoping, which is the first thing you do when the CEO comes in, encompasses scoping if what's the universe of potential acquirers. And, it's, and, and generally, you know if, if this is a business that's ripe more for a strategic or for a PE firm, or you, you have a good sense. And then you go out and you package the, you, you start preparing financials to put them in the best form possible to sell the unit. You, um, and you know, you eventually know if your acquirer is going to be a strategic or a PE or a financial buyer. Um, and that's when you start um, all hands on deck delivering whatever is to be delivered. And it shapes a lot because if you sell to a strategic, you probably have, if it's big enough, someone that can catch the ball and you do um, a network of asset deals around the world and, and you can, I mean, well, you have the belief at least that it will be easier because you have operations that will take on the operations that you're selling. Whereas if it's a PE firm and they don't have a, an entity that has the backbone to take anything, you know you have to stand it up. And the difference yeah. between a deal where you do asset deals uh, in several jurisdictions, and one where you have to stand up an operation is night and day. It's, it's, uh, it's something that can be done in a couple of months for, versus something that is to be done in a year or more. Um, but I think, the, the, to your question, I think you get the sense reasonably quickly of, of, uh, of what's the universe of real buyers, um, and that's, it's at that stage that you start preparing for real. Yeah, I think I think when we are evaluating some of these carve outs, we also look at what are we selling and can this be a can we send a full management team with that, meaning can we sell it to a proper sponsor which cannot bolt into any of their current uh, current portfolio companies. And so I think that's where you start to when you're in the preparation stage stage you kind of delineate and say, We will go to these two sponsors because they have a business where it can be bolted on yeah. and we can't send a management team. Uh, but we won't talk to anybody else, but more, mostly strategics. Whereas if you have a management team, you have a much more broader uh, universe to get to. Mm. And if I may leverage your question for another little nugget, and I know it will go very tactical, but if anyone's thinking of a spin, it will make a difference in your life. Um, if you're selling to a PE, or if you're actually doing a spin and you have to stand up operations, or you're selling to someone who doesn't have operation, which happens a lot, um, don't underestimate how long it takes to set up the infrastructure, the legal entities, um, <laughs> the IT systems. And you know what? To incorporate legal entities, you need a name. They need to have a name. That's every jurisdiction will, will have that. And you know what? You lose a week, two weeks, three weeks defining what the, that name is. And you'll have someone very clever saying, oh, we can't tip off the word that we are um, selling our services division. So we will call them XYZ. And then someone is like, well, XYZ, that doesn't sound great to operate with as a name because changing the name after the fact is a, is a disaster. And the permitting. And, it's, yeah. it's, um, and so think of if you're planning a spin just now, start incorporating your entities and figure out what the name of these shelves will be. I know it sounds tactical, but it can save you months and months and months. And it takes about seven months to incorporate an entity in Vietnam, about nine in the UAE. <laughs> You have to fit that into your timeline. Yeah, no, that, that is an, so I worked on a transaction whereby uh, the only closing conditions or the main closing conditions were, and we were on the sell side, where the only closing conditions were the regulatory filings, and once that got done, we had to close, or we wanted the buyer to close. Um, but this was an asset which was across, across like 27 countries, 
And what we didn't fully understand or realize before we got to signing was all these different countries have different timings for getting permits or legal entities or what have you. And, and half of the assets we were selling were as stock deals, half of them were asset deals. So the stock deals were the easy ones. The asset deals, we had to do an EBT, which was economically benefit, benefited transfer, hmm. whereby we ran the business for the buyer for a period of time with all the liabilities and assets owned by the buyer. But we were operating because the environmental permit was with us, and we, had, we needed time to transition it to the buyer. Uh, so we use that mechanism as well to kind of bridge some of these issues, but uh, these do come up and more so in the emerging markets is what we realized. So, so I, I, with, at the risk of taking us too far afield from your original question, um, one, one thing I would just add to that is, is when you do these complicated carve-outs, um, you, you might want to start planning for staggered closings because you know, if, if you're going to, I mean, you, you look at these timelines just to form an entity to get it, you know, properly set up with the regulatory authorities or, or whatever it is you're doing, or antitrust clearances. I mean, it might be that, that you won't have everything you need to have to sell, you know, all the jurisdictions at the same time. And so if you're going to be smart about it, you got to anticipate that you might have to just, you know, figure out how you're going to let part of the business go and keep part of it until you can let all of it go. Yeah. And even, even if you have one closing, buyers are not too happy with staggered closings no, they're generally. Not. Yeah. Um, they're, they kind of push back. But even and, that, and that's like a whole day, of, well, not day yeah. it's like a month it's of a negotiations. Yeah. <laughs> so even if you have one closing, um, within that period, between sign and close, have staggered closings inside the deal, which is if you're, we separated in 122 countries, you don't get them done in one close, you will do it in tranches, and those tranches still remain massive tranches of 80 countries, 10 countries, whatever, and, um, but that splitting is very important. Now, mm -hmm. ideally, if I was asked, I would close every country when they're ready to close, and that would be uh, maybe 122 different closings. But that's when you talk to the IT guy, and the IT guy says, no, the, the light, the switch needs to go on at the same time for as many entities as possible. Um, and that's where you enter into a negotiation of, okay, how big is going to, to be my, uh, my waves of closings? And, our biggest wave was 80 countries at the same time, which I, I started being nervous when people were talking about closing seven countries at the same time. Um, and we ended up doing 80 just because you, you couldn't do differently. So be ready for a bumpy road. Let's, let's end where, I'm sorry, your question. I was just gonna ask, add that when you're looking at separating something, think about where you're gonna headquarter the new entity, because what may make sense for you may mm -hmm. not make sense for the new oh, spin out point. or the new company. And that's just another Very extra true. wrinkle to think about. So, yeah. 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 Yep. so, so the so. comment you couldn't hear was around headquarters and the actual where's your new co headquarters or spin co headquarters going to be. Certainly a long lead time item. So let's end where we started. So remember when we started, the CEO came and said, the board just decided, let me know how it turns out. So in the minute we have left, you know, the CEO comes back to you when it's all done. You've gained a couple of gray hairs, right? <laughs> Probably a couple of pounds. Went to the gym a little bit less. But the CEO comes to you and said, so, what'd you learn? If you're in like one bullet point, because the CEOs are always in and out and they're always got something else to do, how would you, how would you answer that question based on your experience? Like what would be the one thing that you would tell anybody in the room, watch out for, see around the corner, so you don't make the same mistake that, that we did. Of course, the examples that you're going to give is not because you made them. <laughs> of course. It's because somebody else at another conference told you that they made them. Are you the twins? <laughs> Got it. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, so I would just say that, um, again, going back to my original points around being ready and being ready up front is the key to any, any carve out and any divestiture from a sell side standpoint, uh, and again, focusing on the three aspects, scope, value, and timing. What is important to you? What is going to drive your deal? And, uh, and then making sure that that's what uh, is, is focused at the, at the end of the transaction is what you achieve that same, same result for, from those three as well. Perfect. Um, so the first thing is, um, if you have the opportunity to do a massive care out, a massive spin, do it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's incredible experience. And I know that everyone that has been involved in my teams in, in these deals are, are way better after the deals than they were before. Um, but do just one. 
not three. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need three. Now, in terms of learning, um, it's don't underestimate the beast. It's, it's don't underestimate the level of, of complexity that comes with doing these deals. And don't listen to the bankers that will be telling you this can be done in three months. It cannot. It's, it's <laughs> like pulling out a spaghetti from a bowl of dried spaghetti. That's what you're doing. And as I said at the outset, I mean, I think it's important to have a plan and to stick to it and, and, and to be disciplined. But by the same token, I think you also have to be nimble, especially as, as an attorney. I mean, you really have to be able to counsel your client through all of the twists and turns that you will inevitably encounter, especially you know, in our world today, where you have all these things that are coming at us from, you know, whether it's tariffs or geopolitical issues or what have you, or taxes. I mean, you, you, you have to sort of factor in some cushion for that and, and not freak out when people come and tell you, well, we've got to delay that over there, but you've already told the Works Council in France that you're doing it. And so, you know, yeah. you just you have to be a little nimble. Yeah, perfect. Well, just in, in closing, I think we've summarized, I'll summarize in two bullet points, right? Number one, is that while no two divestitures are created equal, you've been through one, you've been through two, there's always new things to learn and troubles and potholes to watch out for. And then bullet point number two is, you know, building up that, that memory muscle within an organization once you've done it once. And the fact that you say once you've, you want to do it again and again, I'm, I'm, questioning, <laughs> I'm questioning a lot. But, um, you know, make sure you do a look back like a formal process-based look back on what went well, kind of a post-mortem. What went well, what didn't go well, I wish I knew, because somewhere down the line later, they, your organization may do this again. And unless you're him, you're not going to volunteer to raise your hand and do it again. <laughs> so your predecessor has a bit of a playbook, a lessons learned, watch outs, et cetera. And just write it down and codify it in a true, you know, celebratory process because of course your deal was a success. So that's it. Thank you very much.